the name Ruth literally means having compassion for the suffering of another. I picture Ruth as a woman who is bold and unafraid. The thing that really strikes me about Ruth is just her small acts of daily obedience. She was a pretty ordinary person who showed extraordinary faithfulness and loyalty. They talk about a lot in the Hebrew culture about like the Eshet Shael, which is woman of valor, but Ruth is also described as the Eshet Shael. So she is this woman of valor because she's brave and she's unafraid and she's bold and she takes these risks, but it's always centered on, on who God is. In our society, there's so much pressure with social media. We feel this pressure that we have to do something big for God. And the way of Jesus so often is just showing up daily, doing small things with great obedience and love. And I think Ruth's story really speaks to that. I'm drawn to Ruth because she's sort of what I want to be, if that makes sense. Like her ability to push forward in the face of adversity, I feel like there's a lot to be learned about her grit and her determination. She puts love above everything else. My family has grown. In fact, I brought a picture with me uh, of our newest addition to the Scavato family. I know, isn't that sweet? Uh, that's, that's our son, Luca, and his new sister, and baby Nora, and of course our dog trying to get into the middle of things. It's, uh, it's good that we took this picture when we did, uh, because immediately after this moment, my son went knock, 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 and then punched her in the stomach. So, so he gets his nurturing side from his father. That's good. Now, I share this, uh, first of all, just to thank those of you that have reached out and been praying for us. We, we've experienced the kindness of God through our church family so many times, and, and we really are grateful. It's one of the blessings of being in a church community. Uh, but also to share with you that I have not slept in about six and a half weeks, uh, and so you might hear some stuff today that doesn't sound quite right, uh, or maybe doesn't even sound like English. And so if that happens, I'm pulling the new dad card, and I want you to think of these faces when I do that. Sound good? Um, as our family grows, though, this next picture has actually been on my mind quite a bit. Uh, this is one of the walls at my mom's house, uh, and what you're seeing here is kind of a family tree. Maybe you did this back when you were in school where you kind of had to do some research on your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and put together what your history is as uh, a family. And so this is picture form of that. You can see my family on both sides, my mom's and my dad's, traced back generations. Uh, some of whom I know the stories and some of whom I don't. But I love that my parents did this because in a sense, this wall represents a part of who I am and who my children are as well. The reality that for all of us, that, that part of who we are, part of our values and our character and the things that we hold dear have been shaped and formed by those who have come before us and the families to which we belong. And today, this is what we're talking about, not just with my family, but with our family, those who have gone before us in our faith. As I mentioned, this series that we're kicking off is entitled Women of Valor. It's a four-week journey looking at the stories of four different women throughout the Old Testament, all coming from different backgrounds and experiencing different things and, and facing different hardships. And yet they're all united in the fact that God does something in each of their lives that for us today we might consider unexceptional, but in the time of the Old Testament would have been considered extraordinary. As we see God showing up, not just to men, but to women and inviting them into his story and choosing them to be part of his family and by faith, making them part of our family, whose values and character and things that they hold dear form at least part of who we are today. In the video a moment ago, we heard Gretchen talk about the origin of this series title, the Hebrew phrase, Eshet Hayel, this uh, translation of woman of valor. It's a phrase often associated with a, a mighty warrior. It's this picture of strength and fortitude. 
And it's a phrase used to describe our focus today as we look to the story of Ruth. Ruth, if you're uh, newer to scripture, maybe you need a refresher, is the eighth book of the Bible. So if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and turn with me there as she'll be our focus of our study today. So this is our goal as we look to her story and we consider what it is about Ruth that earns her this noble title. What about her is so valiant and fierce that we would look to Ruth's faith, her courage, her trust, and her legacy. And we wouldn't just admire an extraordinary life, although there is much to admire, but that each of us would consider how God is inviting us into his great story as well. So Ruth 1 is where we'll start as we begin by examining Ruth's faith. Ruth's faith, Ruth 1, verse 1, begins like this. During the time of the judges, there was a famine in the land. A man left Bethlehem in Judah with his wife and two sons to stay in the territory of Moab for a while. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. The names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They entered the fields of Moab and settled there. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died, and she was left with her two sons. Her sons took Moabite women as their wives. One was named Orpah, and the second was named Ruth. After they lived in Moab about ten years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and the woman was left without her two children and without her husband. She and her daughters-in-law set out to return from the territory of Moab because she had heard of Moab that the Lord had paid attention to his people's need by providing them food. She left the place where she had been living, accompanied by her two daughters-in-law, and traveled along the road leading back to the land of Judah. Naomi said to them, Each of you go back to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to the dead and to me. May the Lord grant each of you rest in the house of a new husband. She kissed them and they wept loudly. So immediately, we're kind of just thrown into this tragic story. We meet this woman, Naomi, from Bethlehem, who loses her home to a famine, and then her husband, and then her two sons. She's left only with her two daughters-in-law, Orpah, not Oprah, which I have written 8,000 times this week, and Ruth. Now, remember the the time in which we're reading this story, as tragic as this is all on its own, that for Naomi in this moment to be a widow with no heirs and no way to continue her family line was essentially to lose your place in history. Naomi's expectation is that she would return to Israel and would experience nothing but emptiness and bitterness and pain. In fact, we see this later in verse 20. She asks people to stop calling her Naomi, which means gentle and pleasant, and to start calling her Mara, which means bitter. And Naomi knows that if her daughters-in-law come with her, that is the fate that they will experience as well. And so she tells them to go back to the people that they belong to, to return home and find a new family and start a new life as she walks this road on her own. Back when we were still dating, I remember uh, sitting down with Judy and telling her, uh, trying to convince her that she did not want to marry me. It did not work. Um, I I told her I was hesitant, not because of anything that had to do with her, but rather because of the life that I knew God was calling me to. At the time, I was preparing for a life in ministry, and so I sat her down, and I was like, you know, it's not always going to be easy being married to a pastor, and we might be called somewhere that you don't want to go, and we might not always have the nicest of things. Basically, I was giving her the Naomi talk. I was like, don't walk this bitter road with me. No longer should you call me Joe, but Mara for the Lord has made me bitter. Like, go back to your people of Indiana. Like, <laughs> And Judy, like, like she often does, uh, knew that I was being silly and told me so. And she told me that she was in it for the long haul. And this is what we see from Ruth as well. Look at what Ruth says in response. Verse 14. Again, they wept loudly and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Follow your sister-in-law. But Ruth replied, listen to this. Don't plead with me to abandon you or to return and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. 
Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me and do so severely if anything but death separates you and me. I love this last line. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped talking to her. (laughs) There's a great mother-in-law joke to be made there, but my mother-in-law watches our church online, so I'm not going to make it. This This is remarkable though, isn't it? That Ruth, with seemingly nothing to gain and everything to lose, makes this beautiful declaration that Naomi's people, the people of Israel, will become her people. That Naomi's God, Yahweh, will become her God. That she is in it for the long haul. Nothing but death will separate this commitment. It's this beautiful moment of loyalty and courage and care. But notice this as well, that this is also an act of faith. And in this moment, we see a picture of what true, authentic faith really looks like. I love this quote from uh, Tony Evans. He said that faith is acting as if God is telling the truth. Isn't that good? In other words, faith is more than just knowledge. More than just a set of values of what right and wrong looks like. Faith is not just something that is believed. It's something that is lived. And here, Ruth, by faith, declares that she is willing to let go of everything that she knows. That she is willing to let go of any loyalty to her people. Willing to let go any allegiance to her gods. Willing to let go any financial security. Any hope of a second life. Because she believed that God would be with her. And she acted as if that were true. Jesus talks about this in his famous Sermon on the Mount. He said that you cannot serve two masters. You'll either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. And this, I think, is the temptation that many of us face today in our suburban American culture, where so many of us, we love the teachings and the person of Jesus. We're devoted to our faith. We want to grow in our relationship with God. And yet, how many of us can relate to this tension that we face of competing loyalties, of another allegiance? of something else in our life that is fighting for the throne. Our money, financial security, the comfort and security that we can provide for ourselves, our careers, our futures, the plans that we have, the experiences we want to enjoy. Our reputation, we don't want to be labeled in a certain way or be known for certain beliefs. And yet here we see Ruth model and Jesus teach is that this is what it means to live by faith, to live as if God is telling the truth, to know that even if following Jesus costs me something and even if it costs me everything, as long as I have him, I believe that he will be with me and I will have enough. This is Ruth's declaration of faith. The story continues. We'll look next at Ruth's courage. Uh, We're told that that Naomi and Ruth make it back to Bethlehem. And then in chapter two, we pick up the story. Verse one. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side. He was a prominent man of noble character from Elimelech's family. His name was Boaz. Ruth, the Moabites, asked, asked Naomi, will you let me go into the fields and gather fallen grain behind someone with whom I find favor? We'll pause there real quick. Uh, what is happening here is the practice of gleaning. Uh, this is an Old Testament law that was essentially kind of like uh, an ancient welfare system uh, where God commanded people to not gather all of their crops intentionally. They were commanded to leave some behind so that people like Ruth and Naomi and others who were in poverty could pick it up and come behind them so that they could survive. So that's what's happening here. Naomi answered her, go ahead, my daughter. So Ruth left and entered the field to gather grain behind the harvesters. She happened to be in the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who is from Elimelech's family. We picked up in verse eight, Boaz and Ruth meet. And Boaz said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, don't go and gather grain in another field and don't leave this one, but stay here close to my female servants. 
See which field they're harvesting and follow them. Haven't I ordered the young men not to touch you? When you are thirsty, go and drink from the jars the young men have filled. She fell face down, bowed to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor with you so that you notice me, although I am a foreigner? Boaz answered her, Everything you have done for your mother-in-law since your husband's death has been fully reported to me. How you left your father and mother and and your native land and how you came to a people you didn't previously know. Now, notice with me Ruth's courage. And again, remember the the context in which we're reading this story, not in modern America of 2024, but we're told this at the very beginning of Ruth's story, back in verse one, that this is taking place during the time of the judges. Now, we know this from the book of Judges, that this was a period of time in which there was corruption all throughout the nation of Israel. It was kind of this nationwide turning away from God. And so what God did is he allowed other nations to come in and oppress them, including the nation of Moab. And so if you read the book of Judges, you see this refrain over and over show up uh, throughout the book. If your Bible's open, just turn back one page to the end of Judges 21. It says that in those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did whatever seemed right to him. Years ago, I remember visiting my uh, family who live over on the East Coast, and we went to uh, Yankee Stadium in New York City to go see uh, a Yankees game. And and I don't remember who they were playing that day, but I do remember that they weren't playing the Boston Red Sox. Uh, And the reason I remember that is because one of my cousins who came with was a diehard Boston Red Sox fan. And even though the Red Sox were not playing in this game, he wore a Red Sox jersey to the game. Now, if you're not a baseball fan, the Yankees and the Red Sox are like, they don't get along. They're the fiercest rivals in all of sports, some would say. And so my my cousin goes to this game, bright red jersey, Red Sox, not even in the game. And I thought he was going to die. Like, not as a joke, like, haha, no, like he, I was worried. People were offering to fight him. He's like 18 years old, like grown men coming, throwing stuff at him. Like, I didn't even want to be associated with him. Like, he's my cousin, but barely, like, it was terrifying. But I share this because this is the treatment that Ruth might have expected to receive as a Moabite, someone who had oppressed Israel, as a single woman living in a time of corruption, as someone with no status or wealth. For Ruth to step out onto that field that day all by herself was an act of courage. Ruth was living out her faith, living out the promise that she had made to God and to Naomi. In the video earlier, we uh, saw Stephanie talk about the pressure that we so often face as followers of Jesus to do something big for God. You remember that? This pressure that faithfulness to God means I have to change the world somehow. I love how she said this. She said that the way of Jesus so often is just showing up daily, doing small things with great obedience and love. And this is what Ruth shows us, that even with all those very real fears in a time where everyone just did whatever seemed right to them in the moment, Ruth was committed to showing up daily and doing the next good thing that she could that her life was marked by courageous obedience and love. This is what brings her to the attention of Boaz. We read this in verse 11. He says that all you have done for your mother-in-law has been fully reported to me. The truth is in Ruth's story and in our story, even small acts of faithfulness, and small acts of service and small acts of kindness stand out in a world where everyone just does whatever seems right to them. How many of you found that to be true? Has anyone ever done that for you where where for them they did something very small, They, they brought you a meal, they reached out with a phone call, they offered to mow your yard, And to them, it was a small thing, but to you, it meant so much more. A few months ago, um, I was going through the McDonald's drive-thru because, you know, I'm kind of a health nut. It's no big deal. 
I was having a bad day, and, and you know those days where you just need the comfort of french fries? Some of you know that. Uh, and, and I pull up, and I, I go to pay for my order, and they told me that the car in front of me had paid for my meal. It was like $7 or something like that. Just a small thing. But it was what I needed. And as bad as that food was for my body, that's how good it was for my soul. <laughs> and this is what the story reminds us, that kindness, even small acts of kindness, can be multiplied. They have ripple effects all throughout the world. Notice this though, that it's not just other people who see these things, but God himself who sees our small acts of obedience. Look at James chapter one. It says that pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows and their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. In other words, that this is the type of religion that God takes note of. A religion that cares for people who fit the description of Naomi and Ruth. Widows and orphans and immigrants and those who are in need. A religion that shows up when your neighbor is hurting or grieving or in pain. A religion that doesn't feel the pressure to change the world, but understands the call to be obedient. And to do small acts of kindness wherever we see them. A religion that doesn't just know what is good, but does what is good. This is the invitation of Ruth's story. It continues. We'll look next at Ruth's trust. Uh, we see this, that Boaz shows this incredible generosity back to Naomi as she gleans the field and she returns with an incredible harvest and she has this exchange with Naomi. This is verse 19 of chapter two. Her mother-in-law said to her, where did you gather barley today and where did you work? May the Lord bless the man who noticed you. Ruth told her mother-in-law whom she had worked with and said, the name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may the Lord bless him because he has not abandoned his kindness to the living or the dead. Naomi continued, the man is a close relative. He is one of our family redeemers. Notice that phrase family redeemer. Or some translations would say kinsman redeemer or guardian redeemer. Oh, we've talked a little bit about the importance of heritage and family lines back in the ancient world. And, and so some of this might be a little bit uncomfortable or a bit odd for us where it's not something that is valued as highly. Uh, but in the Old Testament law, there was this provision where if a woman had lost her husband and did not have an heir, a family member would step in and in a sense kind of redeem what had been lost. So if there was any land that needed to be bought back, he would do so. If there were any debts that needed to be paid, he would pay them. If there was a wrongful death to avenge, he would even do that. And in situations like this, he would also take the widowed woman as his wife. And for the Israelites, this was seen as an act of love for both parties, for the man who had died and also for the woman who had been left behind. This act of protection and belonging and to continue the family legacy. And so Naomi hears this and she is overjoyed because of all the fields that Ruth could have picked, she picked the one belonging to Boaz, this family redeemer. So the story continues. We read this in chapter three. Naomi comes up with a plan of what they should do. Verse three, she tells her to wash, put on perfumed oil and wear your best clothes. Go down to the threshing floor, but don't let the man know you are there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, notice the place where he's lying, go in and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will explain to you what you should do. We pick up the story in verse eight. She does those things. And at midnight, Boaz was startled, turned over and there lying at his feet was a woman. So he asked, who are you? I am Ruth, your servant, she replied. Take me under your wing, for you are a family redeemer. Then he said, may the Lord bless you, my daughter. You've shown more kindness now than before because you have not pursued younger men, whether rich or poor. Now don't be afraid, my daughter. I will do for you whatever you say, since all the people in my town know that you are a woman of noble character. 
Uh, several years ago, I remember waking up in the middle of the night uh, because my wife had a dream. And in that dream, there was a giant spider that was falling down from the ceiling right towards her face. And the reason I woke up is that her response to this dream was to physically climb over me and push me towards the spider. And she took her pillow with her, but the pillow didn't make it past my face. So imagine waking up to your wife screaming at you to kill a spider that does not exist while you're being smothered. All that to say, I am team Boaz. I understand why he was startled that day. But again, there's so much to look at here. We see this great moment where Boaz uses that phrase we talked about, this eshet chayel, this woman of noble character is how it's translated. And what's interesting is that it mirrors the way that we're introduced to Boaz back in chapter two. He's described as a man of chayel, a man of noble character. So the idea is that these two have met their spiritual match. And that it's not just Boaz, the Israelite man who we are to admire, but also Ruth, the Moabite widow. Now, there's much debate in the Bible scholar world about if the author is trying to imply some sort of scandal here. It seems unlikely given the emphasis being made on their moral character. But notice with me what we see in verse nine, because this is really the center of Ruth's journey. It's what everything has led to and compare it to what we saw back in chapter two. Verse nine, Boaz asks Ruth, who are you? And she says, I am Ruth, your servant. Take me under your wing. Notice that phrase, take me under your wing for you are a family redeemer. Go back to chapter two in verse 12. This is Boaz's blessing he wishes on Ruth. He says, may the Lord reward you for what you've done and may you receive a full reward from the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Now for us, this is a hugely important moment of the story. Because for us, we read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus. And we understand what's happening. We see here that what is happening is that Ruth and Boaz are acting out the gospel story years before it was ever revealed. That Ruth is asking for the protection and the security and the belonging. That's what that phrase represents, the wings of refuge. She's asking for that from God through Boaz, that she would join God's family through his family. And for us, we cannot think about the redemption story without looking to Jesus. Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter one in talking about Jesus, he says, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. In other words, when we put our faith in Christ, Ruth's hope becomes our hope. And Jesus becomes our family redeemer. Jesus pays the debt that we owe. Jesus makes right what is wrong. Jesus invites us into the family of God, gives us a second chance, a new life, a new home. And here, Ruth gives us this beautiful picture of what we are invited to do today in this moment. To cling to our Redeemer. To cry out and to trust in his goodness and his grace offered to you today. Our story continues once more. All throughout the final chapter of Ruth, we see these beautiful redemptive moments of God healing the brokenness that Ruth and Naomi had experienced. We're told that uh, Boaz and Ruth get married and they're blessed with a child and all of Bethlehem celebrates with them. Look at this in chapter four. It says that the women of Bethlehem said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you without a family redeemer today. May his name become well known in Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Indeed, your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Naomi took the child, placed him on her lap and became a mother to him. In other words, this is the complete undoing of how the story begins. Think back to how this story began with famine, with funerals, 
with bitterness, with emptiness. And in this moment, there is community and celebration and new life and joy. And Naomi, who began to cry out about the bitterness of her life, is now holding her grandchild in her arms. And grandparents, is there anything better than that? Here's what I love about the story, that it doesn't even end here. This would be a happy ending, wouldn't it? Everyone is kind of in a good place. Naomi and Ruth are redeemed. Boaz and Ruth have met their match. Everything is great. But look with me to the final verses of our story. Verse 17, the neighbor women said, a son has been born to Naomi and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the family records of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. That's King David. This is the last thing to see today, Ruth's legacy. That amazingly, The story of Ruth is not just a story about a faithful family. And it's not just a story about the power of kindness. And it's not just a story about caring for the immigrant and the widow and those that are in need. This is a story about the legacy of love, that in a time where God's people had been filled with corruption and turned away from him and everyone just did what was right in their own eyes, that God showed up to a poor grieving woman from Moab. And he invited her into his story and her faithfulness helped set the stage to bring about David, their greatest king. And we know that hundreds of years later, another baby from that same family line would be born and his name is Jesus. This is the point of the story that the kindness of Boaz and the faithfulness of Ruth and the courage and the faith that she showed every single day did not just redeem one family, but it helped redeem our family. And when we consider who it is we are and when we look at the pictures of where we have been, one of the pictures that we see is a Moabite woman who knew the power of doing one right thing after another. This is why Ruth is a woman of valor because God invited her into his story and her faith helped set the stage for another moment in the fields of Bethlehem where the angels cried out that the savior is here and the king is born and he has come to redeem us. This is what we remember as we close our time coming to the communion table, which we're going to do in just a moment. You should have received the elements as you walked in today. If not, just throw your hand up and an usher will make sure that gets to you. As we prepare for this uh, table, we want to remind you as always that we don't see this as uh, God's table, but, or as, sorry, as our table, but as God's. Uh, you don't have to be a member to participate in this if you have put your trust in the redemption of Christ you are welcome in this celebration. As we think think about what these elements represent, we're reminded of the night that Jesus instituted this meal. We're told that he was with his disciples and he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread is my body, which is given for you. Whenever you eat this, would you remember the sacrifice and the love that I have for you? Let's eat together now. We're told later that night he took the cup and he said, this cup is my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. That when you drink it, you would know the power of redemption in your life. And so drink and remember him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for reminders of your goodness for examples of courage, examples of faith, 
that point us right back to you. Lord, we pray in this moment that we would be reminded of the power of the bread and the cup to remind us of your sacrifice, to point us toward the cross, to give us hope in the empty tomb. Lord, be with us now. Encourage us with your presence and your spirit. Help us to worship you in this moment. Amen. How good it is to sing praise with our church family. As we close today, just one uh, reminder and announcement I wanted to, to send you with. Uh, our registration for our annual Vacation Bible School is open, so make sure you sign up for that. Additionally, we're looking for those uh, who are willing and able to volunteer uh, to grab. We have a disco ball kind of set up out in the lobby as we start the party. Uh, what a great opportunity that we have to share the love and redemption of Christ with kids all around our community. So hope you're able to make it to that. Now, would you receive today's benediction? Would you go today in the name and the power and the redemption of your Lord Jesus Christ, assured of the promise that he is with you. Amen.